Hi everyone, I'm Emma Edliston, Dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Division. With all of the snow and ice out there, we've all been doing a lot of shoveling, which can lead to overuse injuries of the shoulder, the elbow, the knee, and tonight we're very fortunate to have Dr. Leslie Golden and Dr. Alex Bitzer here to share an overview of those injuries and their treatment. Dr. Bitzer and Dr. Golden are both new faculty in our growing Eastern Panhandle Orthopedics Division. Dr. Golden practices in Jefferson County. She trained in medical school at Emory University and did her orthopedics residency in the, at the University of North Carolina. She then completed a sports medicine fellowship program at the University of Utah. Dr. Bitzer practices in both Berkeley and Jefferson County. He completed medical school at the University of Virginia, followed by an orthopedic surgery residency program at Johns Hopkins University. He then completed a sports medicine fellowship and shoulder elbow fellowship in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're very fortunate to have both of them explaining our overuse injuries tonight and here caring for our patients in our community. Thank you, Dr. Bitzer and Dr. Golden. I'm Leslie Golden and today I'm going to be talking about meniscus tears, which is a common injury of the knee. We're going to talk about what the meniscus is, why it's important, we're going to talk about how it tears, how we evaluate it, and then finally what we do about meniscus tears. So what is the meniscus? The meniscus is a C-shaped piece of cartilage that sits inside the knee. There's one on the medial and one on the lateral side of the knee, so the inside part of the knee and the outside part of the knee. And very simply, it acts as a mechanical bumper or cushion between the femur and the tibia. The reason it's so important is this concept known as hoop stresses. So each meniscus is attached to the tibia in the front of the knee and the back of the knee. Through these attachments, when we weight bear and the femur provides force through the tibia, those forces are spread out. So instead of the force being in one spot, such as in this image where there's no meniscus and the forces are very high, Instead, we get this hoop stress spreading force concept where the forces are shared evenly, evenly over the entire surface of the tibia. So this is the reason why the meniscus is so important. It allows the forces in the knee to be spread out so that we don't have pain. As you can imagine, having really high force at one spot would cause pain. Another important uh, part of the meniscus is its blood supply. So the outside part of the meniscus is called the red zone, and this has good blood supply. But the more inside part of the meniscus, as we get towards the inside of the knee, has less uh, blood available to it. And this has a direct impact on its ability to heal. The way I like to think about this is it's like having a hangnail. If you have a hangnail, we don't try to sew that down or tape it down. It doesn't have any capacity to heal on its own. Instead, you just take off the irritating part that can't heal. On the other hand, if you cut your finger, there's blood supply in that skin and in that tissue. So when we sew it together, it has the capacity to heal. That's a similar concept to the meniscus, and we'll revisit this when we talk about treatment options. How does the meniscus tear? There's two main types of meniscus tear. There's traumatic tears. Often we think about twisting injuries as possibly causing meniscus tears. The meniscus is also more prone to tear if there is another injury in the knee that makes it unstable. We also have degenerative meniscus tears in the setting of arthritis. These are some of the common types of meniscus tears. There's a vertical radial tear, a horizontal tear that's through the body of the meniscus, and this type of tear that's called a bucket handle tear. If you think about it, this piece of tissue that's on the inside part from the tear now has the ability to go back and forth like the handle of a bucket, hence the name. When we talk about the knee and the meniscus specifically, everything is very mechanical. It's a mechanical structure. So if you have a tear like this, you can imagine that this loose piece now has the ability to move back and forth in the knee and cause pain and mechanical locking and catching symptoms. So how do we evaluate the knee and the meniscus? The history, so often, as I mentioned, we have a twisting injury. Inability to fully straighten or bend the knee, that can be from that mechanical block from the loose piece pain and deep flexion when we load the knee and we load the meniscus, and then catching and locking of the knee. Again, all mechanical type symptoms. On the exam, we can see joint line tenderness, and then we can reproduce that pain and deep flexion 
and with a test called the McMurray's test. When we get to imaging to evaluate the meniscus, we always get an x-ray first. The main thing we're looking for on the x-ray is signs of arthritis. This is a normal knee x-ray. You can see there's good space between the bones on the lateral and the medial side. When we look at x-rays, we can see the bones very well. What we don't see is the soft tissue, such as the meniscus. So if there's space here, it means that there's cartilage and meniscus there. When we look at MRI cuts, what we're trying to see is this nice black line. So the meniscus should look like a black triangle on the outside of the knee and on the inside of the knee without any white lines or stripes in it. When we look at it on a different view from the lateral or the sagittal view, again, you see this nice black triangle, one in the front, one in the back. Same thing, one in the front on the lateral side of the knee, one in the back. So these are all normal images of what the meniscus should look like. When we talk about abnormal imaging for the meniscus when we're trying to find a tear, this is what I was talking about when there's arthritis in the knee. So as you can see, the space on the inside or medial part of the knee is much narrower than the space on the outside. That means that there's not as much cartilage and meniscus there, and that's why that space is narrowed. There's almost certainly a meniscus tear here because that would be that degenerative type tear. This is what's called a radial tear or a root equivalent tear, where there's a white stripe between this part of the meniscus and the part where it attaches in the back of the knee. If you think about those hoop stresses we talked about earlier, this essentially doesn't allow that hoop to dissipate the stretch. Here's a horizontal tear through the body of the meniscus. This is what's called that bucket handle type tear where the tear is allowing this piece to flip up into the knee. And this is a complex tear. We can see white lines in multiple planes in the knee. So these are all different things we could see on the MRI that are consistent with a meniscus tear. So then we talk about what are the treatment options. For degenerative type tears in the setting of knee arthritis, a small arthroscopic procedure does not reliably improve pain. If the symptoms are very mechanical in nature, locking, catching, we can do the small scope surgery to remove the irritating part of the meniscus, but we have no way of restoring the cartilage that is lost or shaving out the arthritis. So in this setting where there is already arthritis, surgery, arthroscopic or minimally invasive surgery for a meniscus tear is significantly less predictable and reliable. On the other hand, in these traumatic tears in a healthy knee, both surgery and non-operative options can be appropriate depending on patient factors and the tear characteristics. In terms of non-operative management, we can do physical therapy to get the motion back into the knee that can smooth out any rough parts of the meniscus, and as well as strengthening all the muscles around the knee to compensate. We can also use over-the-counter NSAIDs to help with any inflammation that the tear is causing. Weight loss, because overloading the part of the knee where there is a tear can be problematic and symptomatic. And then injections of steroid or there are other types of injections. These other injections are things you might have heard about, such as visco supplementation or PRP, and that is certainly for another talk as the uh, evidence remains um, undecided on whether those are helpful. Steroid helps if the knee is very inflamed from the tear, and we can see if helping with that inflammation allows the patient to return to their activities. When we talk about surgical options, that can be the minimally invasive arthroscopic debridement where we do a cleanup. We can repair the meniscus if it's in that vascularized red-red zone, or if in the setting of knee arthritis, a total knee replacement as the small surgery is not predictable. So these are just some pictures. This is that cleanup surgery where we shave out the part of the meniscus that is problematic or use a biter to remove the, the rough edge. This is putting a stitch to do a meniscal repair. And finally, a knee replacement. So a meniscus tear is a very common orthopedic procedure, but it has a range of treatment options and um, should be evaluated by an orthopedic provider. So. Hey, good afternoon. I'm uh, Alexander Bitzer. I'm going to be uh, presenting just some general topics of uh, overuse injuries in the uh, shoulder and elbow. Uh, given that it's winter time here, we're sort of doing a bit of a symposium on, on injuries um, that may happen during the winter time. Um, a quick overview of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to talk briefly about some uh, overuse injuries in the shoulder, including uh, arthritis, uh, focusing on glenohumeral osteoarthritis, which is the true ball and socket joint, looking at uh, rotator cuff tears as well, which is some of the muscles and tendons around the uh, shoulder girdle, and finally some labral injuries of the shoulder. And then I'll transition over to the elbow, where I'll talk about um, osteoarthritis of the elbow, as well as epicondylitis, or what we uh, colloquially um, describe as a tennis elbow or golfer's uh, elbow. 
So I'll begin with shoulder arthritis. Uh, glenoid humeral arthritis is a degenerative joint disease of the shoulder characterized by damage to the articular surface of the um, ball and socket uh, of the uh, shoulder joint, which is called the humeral head, of course, and the uh, glenoid. The degenerative change is at the level of the cartilage itself, which is lining the two uh, bones. Um, and that's really what uh, defines arthritis. It's usually I tell patients in clinic, uh, arthritis is more the absence of something than the presence. And the absence of uh, the problem is really a cartilage issue. And so that's something that, um, that I'd like to sort of share with you all. Um, importantly, it's more common in women than men. Uh, there's primary um, osteoarthritis, which just happens uh, typically um, there's a genetic predisposition in someone that uh, tends to have arthritis on their joints in their body and has a family history of shoulder, knee, hip uh, arthritis. Uh, and certainly it can also happen secondarily. Um, Post-traumatic uh, arthritis is something that, that occurs when uh, you have a trauma to the shoulder and of course if you have a trauma to the ball and socket joint and you scuff up some of the cartilage, that lining that I talked about before, then certainly that can predispose you towards developing arthritis down the road. Inflammatory arthritis, uh, which is um, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, osteonecrosis, which is when uh, the blood supply um, dies to the, uh, the humeral head or the ball side of the joint, um, which can happen due to chronic steroid use, uh, alcoholism, uh, can happen uh, as a result of trauma. Um, and then finally neuropathic and then a rotator cuff arthropathy. Uh, which is if your rotator cuff does not work, at some point the, um, the ball might not sit in the center of the joint and that can cause some arthritis uh, down the road. So here's some x-rays. I typically show uh, my patients these in clinic uh, when I kind of show them what a normal shoulder joint is supposed to look like. So the image on the left, um, I sort of show them here's the ball and then here's the socket. And importantly, there's a good amount of space between those two. And so what that space really means is that there's cartilage in between those two things. It's not just free space just floating, it means that cushion is still there. Conversely, when you look at the right image, that ball is there, that socket is there, but there's really no space in between. In addition to that, you can see that the humeral head itself, the ball, is flat in certain areas. It's not that nice sort of round um, spherical structure, it's kind of this flattened um, dysmorphic uh, ball with small little divots here, some cysts that are located here, and then typically we call this a goat's beard osteophyte, which is where you have an osteophyte on the inferior portion of the humeral head. You can also see some osteophyte formation, and that's really just a fancy word for spur. Um, and so uh, those spurs, uh, which people will see in hip arthritis and knee arthritis and shoulder arthritis, what those spurs really are is the bone reacting to too much force being seen at that joint bone's kind of dumb in the sense that it doesn't really know how to deal with these issues except to make more bone. And so when you start seeing that, it's because the bone itself is seeing a problem. The bone is seeing a problem because the cartilage is the problem because it's worn out. So shoulder arthritis and treatment, uh, mainstay of non-operative management are anti-inflammatory medicine, physical therapy, cortisone injections. Um, Anti-inflammatory medicine does very well, uh, typically, especially in the early stages of arthritis. Physical therapy um, is helpful in terms of keeping motion in an arthritic shoulder. Um, I tell folks motion is lotion. And so the more um, a joint is able to move, despite having some arthritis, the better function a person's gonna have and overall pain control. And then cortisone injections are a bit of a band-aid, um, but they certainly can help folks um, with acute episodes of pain uh, by just decreasing the inflammation of the shoulder joint. And then finally, um, there's always the option of a shoulder replacement if the symptoms become severe enough. And typically, um, I tell patients, uh, you know, when your pain is such that you say, I don't really want to live with this shoulder any longer, I just can't bear the pain, it's gotten severe enough where it's really changing my quality of life, then I tell folks sometimes one of these two options is a good one. Um, the difference between these two options is whether your rotator cuff works or not. Um, and this just has to do with the mechanics of the, the implant and the shoulder. So here's, again, the arthritic shoulder. That cartilage has worn out um, and you're causing pain and inflammation. And then you can either treat it with an anatomic shoulder replacement, which is you're basically resurfacing the head with metal here and resurfacing the glenoid or the socket with plastic. And that's why it's called anatomic, because the anatomy remains the same. In a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, called reverse because you're actually reversing the anatomy of the shoulder. You're putting a 
ball where the socket is and where the ball was, you're putting a socket. So you're reversing things and the reason um, you do that is because it uh, actually allows the shoulder to function based off of the deltoid uh, rather than needing the rotator cuff. So it's a good option for folks with rotator cuff arthropathy or certain conditions where the rotator cuff isn't functioning well. Okay, so now we'll move on to a rotator cuff tears. Uh, they're a very common source of shoulder pain and dysfunction in the population. Uh, I'm sure many, uh, many folks have uh, heard a relative speaking of maybe a rotator cuff tendonitis tear, etc. So um, the majority of them are degenerative uh, due to chronic uh, intrinsic uh, degeneration to the tendon itself, usually due to something called impingement where when you elevate your arm, you're hitting the, um, the tendons against uh, the acromion bone or the undersurface of it. Uh, but sometimes they may also be traumatic. Uh, risk factors for um, rotator cuff tears are age, smoking, family histor history, and then high uh, cholesterol levels. So what is the uh, rotator cuff um, of the uh, shoulder? Uh, really it's a collection of uh, different muscles about the uh, shoulder blade or the scapula. And there's um, four that we typically focus on. Uh, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres mitre, and the subscapularis. This is in the front, this is in the top, this is in the back, and this is in the inferior back. This is the front of the shoulder, the back of the shoulder. This is kind of a view looking on fossil, the glenoid here. And so the real main job of the rotator cuff is, um, folks always think of it as, you know, letting me elevate my arm or turn my arm out and so. Um, it, it does let you do those things, but the main focus of the rotator cuff is to really center the humeral head inside of the glenoid when you are using your deltoid and other uh, muscles as a lever arm. Uh, constantly your deltoid when it fires is trying to make this humeral head escape superiorly and your rotator cuff is again there to keep it centered um, in an anterior to posterior direction and a north to south direction. And then this is an example here of the um, overuse or the impingement. Um, that happens when you have this spur, again, that bone that I talked about, and you're abutting the tendons against that, um, and that can cause rotator cuff tears as well. So treatment for rotator cuff pain um, that goes along the spectrum from tendonitis to partial tear to full thickness tears. Um, always NSAIDs, again, anti-inflammatory medicine, which can be helpful. Physical therapy can be extremely helpful, whether you just have tendonitis, a partial tear, or even a full thickness tear, uh, because if you uh, strengthen some of the other tendons around a tendon that is either partially hurt or fully hurt, uh, you can still be able to compensate so that you have excellent function and uh, not so much pain. Injections can also be helpful. Again, these are cortisone injections which can help with inflammation. And uh, typically injections are really helpful when someone has an acute exacerbation of pain. Um, you get their pain under control so they can participate in physical therapy. Participate in physical therapy, get the shoulder stronger, the muscles that are compensating stronger. And then when the cortisone injection wears off, the shoulder is actually in a better spot than it was prior to receiving the injection. So even though the injection sometimes is again thought of as a band-aid, it can at least give you temporary relief enough so that you can participate fruitfully with physical therapy. So again, you can um, get the most out of uh, therapy when you participate. Um, and then you can stay in the non-operative treatment for a rotator cuff tear, even if it's a full thickness tear, um, indefinitely. And I've seen people do really well with that. Um, importantly though, you do have to discuss the natural history with patients where if you have a full thickness tear of the tendon, that tendon's never going to heal on its own. It's going to continue to retract, the muscle will atrophy some, and you may have some symptoms long term. And so it's fair to treat them, um, full thickness tears, uh, without surgery, but people just need to know that that is sort of the natural history and the progression of the, of the disease when one chooses that. Conversely, um, if there is a full thickness tear, typically we repair these. Uh, here's an example of a full thickness tear. Again, that tendon that's supposed to be connecting to the humeral head and balancing it within the socket has torn, it's elevated. You see this hole here. Um, and so what we do is we basically put some anchors in the bone and we suture the tendon back down to the bone and you end up not being able to see this hole anymore. And so here's again that humeral head, the footprint, and the tendon is back down. And so I always give an example, um, uh, it's kind of like a bungee cord, the bungee cord has come off, you grab the bungee cord and you basically put it back onto the, the bone on the humeral head. Other options are superior capsule reconstruction, tendon transfers, and reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which is a little bit beyond uh, this talk. Um, 
Finally, I'll move over to uh, labral tears. Um, labral tears can be a consequence of um, a few different things. Typically, it's due to a traumatic injury from um, uh, either uh, elevating and abducting your arm or forcefully having your um, humeral head jolted backwards, kind of in a pushing position. Um, these can also cause slap tears, uh, which are when you tear the superior aspect of the labrum that is connected to your biceps tendon. Um, this biceps tendon is actually the one that obviously connects down here in your arm, comes up to the front, and inserts on the top of the labrum. And so these all sort of go together in a, in a spectrum or, continu or a continuum of uh, injury. And so these can all be treated mostly with physical therapy. Um, however, if they uh, continue to be symptomatic, you can always repair the labrum back to the, um, the socket or the glenoid. Um, another option if the um, biceps tendon itself is injured is that you can tune a decent where you basically reattach it where it belongs in the, uh, the groove of the humerus. Um, but again, these are kind of overuse injuries and throwing a lot of them. Uh, them can also be traumatic in nature. Uh, we'll shift over now from the shoulder over to the elbow. Um, elbow arthritis is not too common compared to shoulder, hip, and knee, but it certainly does happen, um, particularly in folks who uh, do a lot of manual labor. And so again, when we're thinking of overuse injuries, and especially during winter time with a lot of shoveling and um, a lot of other activities like that where you're using your upper extremities, uh, this is something that can flare up on folks. Importantly, uh, men have four times more likely to develop uh, osteoarthritis of the elbow. Again, like uh, I talked about in the shoulder, when it came to arthritis, there's primary, osteoarthritis is secondary, and the causes are kind of the same as in the shoulder in terms of post-traumatic, inflammatory, um, and uh, one that can be caused due to instability and scuffing of the cartilage if the joint is not stable. Um, the main way that uh, um, elbow osteoarthritis actually shows up is a little bit different than in other joints in the sense that it's usually due to lack of range of motion is what folks actually notice, and then pain at the end of arc. So a little bit different than night pain or resting pain or pain at the end of the day after a lot of activity, which happens in other joints. This is more so a stiffness type sensation and also pain at the end of arc, so at full extension or at full flexion. Um, uh, osteoarthritis treatment, um, again, non-operative treatments are anti-inflammatory medicine, cortisone injections, uh, resting splints to really try and get as much uh, motion as you can. Uh, physical therapy is incredibly helpful in terms of maximizing range of motion um, and getting the, the elbow functional, which is really uh, anywhere from 30 degrees of extension to 130 degrees of flexion and then activity modification as well, of course. If you um, stop doing what makes it hurt, uh, then it will feel better. And sometimes just explaining that will actually uh, be helpful for some uh, patients. And then ultimately, um, if all those things fail, there is operative treatment by way of uh, one option is an arthroscopic debridement, which is typically what I offer a lot of patients. Um, if their main complaint is pain at end of arc and as well range of motion, because you can go in there and debride some of the spurs and some of the um, damage that's done inside the joint to actually improve the range of motion, improve the pain. The only difference is that you can't improve the, the cartilage loss that is already there that has caused the disease. So it's important to note that. There's also an interposition arthroplasty where you stick something, uh, a graft in the joint itself to kind of cover it and prevent the bones from rubbing against one another, which can be helpful. And then there's an elbow replacement, which looks like this. Now, compared to most replacements, elbow replacements are really um, kind of uh, nuanced and a little bit difficult to not only perform but also to rehab and to maintain. Um, so they're usually um, uh, used more for the elderly population with low demand only because some of the restrictions employed when uh, one replaces the, the elbow are pretty, um, are pretty strenuous uh, to, to keep and maintain. Then finally, I'll get into uh, lateral and medial epicondylitis. These are extremely common. I see this in my clinic at least once every clinic. Um, and so lateral epicondylitis is tennis elbow. So that's uh, when you basically get inflammation and tendonitis of the insertion of the common extensor mass onto the lateral side of the elbow. So a lot of people will come in and say, I've, you know, ever since I started shoveling my, back, you know, my uh, front yard uh, the other day, it's been killing me right over here. And immediately I, I know it's, it's this. Um, typically happens to the dominant arm. It's the most common origin of pain of the elbow, as I discussed, one or three percent of adults annually. And the far majority of these are non-operative. Um, the big ones are activity modification, bracing, and physical therapy. Bracing that's helpful is there's a counterforce strap that you wrap around here that can basically offload the, that insertion of those tendons on the side. 
uh, physical therapy to help with eccentric strengthening and basically strengthening and stretching of the muscle without overtaxing it and then activity modification again avoiding things that make it hurt which in this case um, are uh, wrist extension and uh, finger extension um, activities uh, also there's acupuncture and uh, needle treatments that are helpful and finally uh, at some point there are people that fail non-operative treatment which is a, are the few um, patients that do and so when that happens uh, you end up uh, basically debriding this tendon that is no longer healthy and then you repair it down with some anchors. Medial epicondylitis is the twin of lateral epicondylitis um, instead of tennis elbow this is called golfer's elbow and this is on the inside portion of the elbow now and um, it's five to ten less com uh, times less common than lateral epicondylitis. It's an overload at the flexor common uh, pronator mass, which instead of the extensors, these are the flexors of your forearm. They connect, their origin is right at the little bony origin there, and that tendonitis, that, um, uh, that area where that, the tendon inserts on the bone is where uh, the injury is. This is caused by repetitive uh, movements with wrist flexion and pronation, so it happens in golfers, bowlers, and weightlifters see this a lot in weightlifters, especially uh, folks that are doing pull-ups, because if you think of when you're doing a pull-up, you're flexing your wrist and you're pronating at the same time, and so that can, um, that can make uh, a lot of folks hurt. Uh, importantly, you have to evaluate for ulnar nerve symptoms, because the ulnar nerve is right there. Um, finally, treatment is very similar to um, tennis elbow, and uh, very, very rarely uh, is operative treatment needed for this condition, but certainly the same applies if um, unable to get better after at least six months of therapy, continue to have symptoms, uh, get an MRI and there's a small tear there, then it's treated similar to tennis elbow where you basically debride the origin of that tendon that no longer is able to heal and function, and then you repair the healthy tendon back down to the bone. Importantly, you have to consider the ulnar nerve when treating any of these surgically to see if it needs to be decompressed and opened up. I think that's it. Thanks for paying attention.